Oh, there's a bell. <laughs> All right. Uh, so it's a pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Michael Cantrell from the University of Illinois at Chicago. And he's going to tell us something about ergodic theory and the rigidity of lipodomics. Yeah, thanks for the invitation, Ilya, and thanks for all of you to, for coming. Um, right, so I'm going to talk about nilpotent groups and some ergodic theory and some uh, rigidity theories. So, I mean, I don't know exactly everyone's background, so I'll be interested in finitely generated groups. And uh, just a reminder that this is what it means to be uh, nilpotent. So you look at these commutators, and this terminates after finite time. Um, and so, if you haven't thought about nilpotent groups too much, maybe you think for the talk about upper triangular integer matrices. So this is nilpotent. Uh, it's the <coughs> integer Heisenberg group. And it's almost true that uh, all nilpotent groups look like this. So you can almost think of just upper triangular matrices and integers. So this is a theorem of Malsef in the 40s. So it says that if you have uh, finitely generated uh, torsion-free nilpotent group gamma, then so every finitely generated torsion nilpotent uh, group gamma has a unique uh, connected I guess it's simply connected uh, nilpotent Lie group called the Malsef completion. And I'll denote it M gamma. Um, OK, so that gamma is actually a subgroup of this nilpotent Lie group. And it's sitting in there in a co-compact way. And the torsion free is really no assumption. It's like a finite, uh, finite subgroup, normal subgroup, and so you take a kernel. Um, OK, so you can really think of upper triangular matrices. And I want to talk about, so geometry is not included but in the title, but I want to talk about the geometry of nilpotent groups. And so I was told that everyone knows what the Cayley graph is. <laughs> yeah, so OK, cool. Uh, so there's the Cayley graph, and that turns my finitely generated group into a geometric object, right? And then how about quasi-isometry? <laughs> um, I guess I need a new board. And I was told I should recall this. So um, so I'll denote it QI. And I guess the point is that these Cayley graphs, um, they're sort of not well-defined, but they are up to quasi-isometry. This is really a relation on metric spaces, but uh, I'm just going to be thinking about these groups and their metric spaces. So I'll say that. Um, so two finitely generated groups are quasi-isometric if there is some constants and a map between them. So it's almost by Lipschitz up to an additive error. So let's see if I can do this. Uh, okay, so if I want to look at the points in the image, that's at most scaling by a multiplicative constant, and then adding a constant, and then the lower bounds similar. OK, so that's for all of the gammas and gamma primes and gamma. So that's one condition. And the second is it should be quasi-surjective, which is to say that the C neighborhood of the image uh, covers the other group. OK, so this is uh, an equivalence relation. And a first example. Is, is these two metric spaces, actually. So being a compact, uh, co-compact lattice is a source of quasi-isometry. And since it's actually an equivalence relation, this implies that uh, if two nilpotent groups have the same you know, isomorphic Malsef completions, uh, then they're quasi-isometric. Yep. And so there's a big open question, um, which is the converse. So if, I mean, right. So this, this statement only makes sense for nilpotent groups, right? Because uh, it's the only time that you have these associated 
massive groups. So the question is that if you have, uh, you know, amongst finitely generated nilpotent groups, in fact, you don't really have to say this because being nilpotent is a quasi-isometry invariant. But anyway, uh, if you have quasi-isometric nilpotent groups, does that imply that they have the same amounts of completion? So this question uh, is going to motivate everything that comes next, I guess. Any map, any map, yeah. Yeah, it's just a map. But so this question comes from now that it's still right. Yeah, I'm going to kind of get there. Um, so I'm going to lead to some partial results on this. Um, but first, I wasn't ever actually thinking about this question when I started my thesis, so I don't want to tell you about my thesis, but it's related. So if you were thinking about this question, uh, one thing you might think about, uh, if you're thinking about quasi-isometry of, of groups, is the asymptotic cone. Okay, so I want to give you a reminder of what the asymptotic cone is, so I won't write the definition, but it's associated to a metric space, and I'm just thinking about groups again. Um, so here are, you know, the integers. And what you're supposed to do to see the asymptotic cone is fix your eyes on one point and start walking backwards, okay? So when you take a step back, the points get closer. And when you keep doing that, uh, they get really, really close. And in the limit, you can't tell that they're points anymore. And you see the real line. So I'm trying to say that the asymptotic cone of the integers is the reals. Okay, this is a little bit loose. Um, but if you know, just keep quiet. I'll get there. Um, Okay, so here's the kaleigraph of, uh, a kaleigraph of z squared. And do the same thing, look at the center point and walk backwards. The lines all start to blur, and in the limit you see R2. Okay, so the initial metric affects the limiting metric of the asymptotic cone. Uh, so here you can only move in the coordinate directions, um, so the limit object should, should know that. So the limiting metric on the asymptotic cone for this kaleigraph is the L1 metric. So maybe the first question I'll ask, well, besides this big open question, is what about gamma and nilpotent? So draw the Cayley graph, a Cayley graph of the Heisenberg group and start walking backwards. What do you see? Is it something coherent? And Pansu answered this, uh, 1983, I think. So this was his thesis. And so he says that uh, every finally generated nilpotent gamma has a unique connected, simply connected, now it's graded also, uh, graded nilpotent Lie group. I don't know how to stop that noise, I'm sorry. So I'll call it G infinity, and uh, I'll refer to this as the Carnot group. Um, okay, so every gamma has, has some Lie group G infinity with the property that, oh, this is too small, um, such that for every right invariant, some technical word inner uh, metric, D on gamma, so for every such metric, there's a unique homogeneous Carnot Carthiodori metric D infinity on G infinity, so that G infinity with this metric is the asymptotic cone of gamma, so that G infinity G infinity is the unique asymptotic cone of gamma with D. Okay, so let me back up for a second. One thing I didn't tell you is that it's not always so nice. So here there's like one space all of the time, and that's also, I mean, one underlying space with different metrics, I and mean, that's not always the case. So these things don't always even exist along a sequence. Sometimes you have to take a convergent subsequence, and which subsequence you take will drastically affect the limit object, which is the asymptotic cone. So usually they don't exist along the full sequence, only along a subsequence uh, for like hyperbolic groups. Um, and the space might not be Hausdorff. But for nilpotent groups, 
there is this one group, and it's very nice, and it has a property that any metric you put on gamma, the asymptotic cone of, of that space is some associated metric on this, on this group. So graded means that there's a one parameter family of automorphisms of the group, uh, which I'll call like dilations or homotheties. And the homogeneity of the limit metric means that when you dilate by t, it scales the distance of the points by t. carnot theodori means that it's, this manifold is a sub-Ramanian manifold, um, sub-Finland manifold. And I won't say what inner is, but sorry, one example of a right invariant inner metric is the word metric. So the Cayley graphs that we started with are such uh, metric spaces. So far, so good. Okay, uh, so I guess an example, the example. Yeah, it's usually left. I mean, I could, you can think left. I'm gonna end up wanting right, and it's for some stupid reason that doesn't really matter. You can think left the whole time, but it's the same side, right? Uh, this is right invariant. I guess I didn't say that. And they're the same side invariant. So an example of this, well, actually, both groups for the Heisenberg group are the real Heisenberg group. Um, so this is also the Malsef completion, but this isn't usually true, that they're the same. So how do you put them first in your um, Non-isomorphic as groups. I mean, they'll have, yeah. So is there a simple example? When <coughs> you have to go to dimension five. So it's not so simple. I mean, it's not hard, but. Um, but it really is, yeah. They really are different. Uh, I don't want to write the example now. Okay, so my question is, what about random metrics? But is one of them always a subject of another? Is it just no, no. So in general, gamma is not a subgroup of the associated Carnot, and that's the source of all of the problems in this world, it, from my point of view, is it doesn't even sit as a subgroup. So it's always a subgroup of, of this guy, but uh, it's only asymptotically, geometrically associated to, to this guy, which is a source of headaches. So I want to take one of these Cayley graphs and then randomize the metric uh, on the graph. So this, uh, I'll give you an example of random metrics that other people have looked at. Uh, they come from first passage percolation. And so here's what you do. You draw a Cayley graph of a group, so I'll just draw Z squared again. I don't want to draw the Heisenberg group. And at each edge, you should stand there and flip a coin. And if it lands heads, you should mark the edge one. If it lands tails, mark the edge two and do that everywhere, okay? So once you've flipped, you know, this countably many coins and you've labeled them all, you get a metric space. You just want to think of the label as the time it takes to cross the edge and you just want to minimize the time between two points. You can get between two points. So this gives you a random metric, right? Because there's a probability space of possible outcomes. Okay, so people have studied this for various reasons, um, but now you could ask yourself, uh, well, is there an asymptotic cone for these random metric spaces? Are they related somehow? Um, under what conditions is there an asymptotic cone for this family of random metric spaces? So these are not right invariant anymore? They're not right invariant, yeah. That's right. So the example I gave you is right equivariant. Okay, and of course, the, the labels don't have to be ones and twos. You can put any distribution on the edges as long as you flip the same coin. Then it's IIDs, and that's under the title of first passage percolation. But so there always is an asymptotic cone. You just want to know that it's somehow. Okay. Yeah. If it's along the full subsequence, I guess, right? Without taking an ultra filter. Okay, this isn't actually, I just want to motivate the question. This isn't how I was thinking of it ever. Um, but. 
So this is part of my thesis with my advisor, Alex Herman, uh, is answering this question in a slightly more general setting. So I'll tell you what the more general random metrics are. I have a finally generated null potent group. And here's my sense of random metric that generalizes that one. It's an ergodic probability measure preserving action. Um, OK, and I want to have a family of metrics indexed by this probability space. Um, So these are metrics on gamma. Now I need some conditions. So uh, Pansu needed innerness, and we also need innerness. So I guess I'll say that uh, I need some conditions. One will be that uh, almost surely this metric is inner on gamma. So this is a pointwise version of Pansu needs. Uh, instead of right invariance, I'm going to have right equivariance. So this is to say that if I want to measure the distance between two points after moving the base point x, um, that should be the same as. Sorry, what is the right way? What's the subscript of your word u? Uh, this is gamma acting on x. Right, so gamma is acting on x, and I have this measurable family. So I want the the metrics on gamma to know that, um, that there's a gamma action on x. So this is equivariance. And this seems like sort of minimal assumptions, but I need some integrability assumption also. So I need, and this is probably too strong, but I need some interval bounded away from 0 and infinity um, so that there's a uniform by Lipschitz estimate. This is for almost every x. And where d is some word metric. So, sorry, what's the reason there? Like sorry, is this too small? No, no, no. I mean, the middle. So, so what's the other issue? So, this is uh, the, the difference between the metric dx and some reference word metric d. At any two points, that should be bounded between oh. these two constants. I see. Okay. So, it's like a uniform pointwise by Lipschitz okay. condition. OK, so if I have these conditions, then um, so there exists a unique carnot kerr theodori metric on this associated Carnot group such that for almost every x, uh, it's the asymptotic cone of the random metric space. So uh, p infinity with this metric is the unique cone of gamma with the random metric dx. OK, so like you pointed out, you don't know that any, any of them have a cone because they're not right invariant. They're only right equivariant. Uh, just a second. Um, uh, so, so now, uh, when you say cone, you probably I meant asymptotic. Yeah, I was just no, running no, out of I space. Mean, uh, I understand that. But uh, I suspect now that you mean something other than So when I say unique, I mean it's along the full sequence. So there's no need for any non-principal ultra filter. It will give you the same limit. So, ah, so you're saying that basically that the sum of x doesn't depend on the ultra filter. And That's right. And doesn't depend on the sequence of base points. You know, or That's, yeah, right. I mean, yeah, I've been leaving out the identity, but you should, okay. I mean. That's, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so for every non-principal ultra filter, you get the same thing, which is just like in Pansu's statement. Except that uh, it's uh, well, but a priori the sequence of base points can actually affect you know the outcome, you know. But I think this equivariance condition probably says that it doesn't you know, have some degree of homogeneity, you know, because the, the moment I see right, it is not as homogeneous as right. well. I mean, so this guy's as homogeneous, but uh, but gamma with dx isn't as homogeneous, is what you're saying, right? Okay. So, 
so in this example, x is the sort of the space the of labelings of ones and twos to the edges with a product, with a product measure. So this is a special case here. Um, it's, this is actually more general because all of those examples were IIDs, but you can imagine that you actually have non-trivial correlation between the edges. Uh, this can really happen uh, as long as the metrics are still ergodic, um, then our theorem applies. But, so this is a special, yeah, motivating example. Uh, so uh, could you say a few words about what inner means? Yeah, so it sort of means asymptotically geodesic. So um, I, defining it would be sort of bad, but I guess if you want to have a limit of some metric spaces under gromov hausdorff convergence that limit to something that's geodesic, then it, it's necessary for it to be inner. So it's sort of not an assumption here. Um, but it sort of says that uh, on big distances, the metric space is one plus epsilon geodesic. So I should say that Benjamini and Tessera proved the same theorem in the case of IIDs in 2014. So uh, this is the same, the same theorem, but for first passage percolation. So. And in this setting, the, their results are actually stronger. So you could think of this integrability con condition as being like a, um, well, it's like an L infinity integrability condition, some sort of boundedness, and they have an exponential moment, which is better, right? I didn't say, I didn't specify what the distribution was like. So their, res their results are stronger in that context. Um, but they use statistics, and it doesn't seem to generalize to this ergodic setting. The source condition was Yeah, so you, you, de you definitely can't ask for L1. So even for ZD, if you want pointwise convergence, you have to look at the Sobolov space, LD1. So no one really knows the right uh, pointwise integrability assumption for, uh, for nilpotent groups. It's probably something to do with the growth. Um, but we didn't try that because we got the first passage percolation. And, um, okay. So I guess uh, the reason people were studying first passage percolation, uh, or well, they were studying it for, for lots of reasons, like modeling like oil going through the soil and you know like spread of disease and stuff. Um, but one question that they asked is, what does the ball of radius r look like? in the random metric dx. So I just want to, I mean, I think this is a cute question. So you have this, these random labels, and now you want to say, like, you know, where is my gas gone after time t um, in this random metric? And so in the case of ZD, a bunch of people studied this for quite a while. So uh, Cox and Durrett, uh, Keston, Levon, and some other people, and it ended in 1990. ZD. And so you can see the theorem as, uh, and they proved it as well, as uh, answering this question for first passage percolation. So I just wanted to kind of show you the picture of the answer for Z squared because it's kind of cool. What it says is that there's some, well, there's a norm <laughs> on the asymptotic cone, which is R2, so that the level set of that norm, if you want to know what the ball of radius R looks like in the random metric, mm -hmm. you should just dilate that ball of radius 1. And then you'll be sublinearly close. Your random metric will be sublinearly close to the, this one fixed shape. So they call this an asymptotic shape theorem because asymptotically, the ball of radius r looks like this one fixed shape. Um. So it's always, in, in this example here, it's between two balls, right? Oh, so, so actually, uh, no one knows what the shape is, for example, even in this case. So I don't think that it's, well, maybe it's obvious. Well, I mean, you just know <laughs> that it's something that is contained in the ball of radius r and contains the ball of radius r of a two for the standard metric, right? OK, but it's a little low of r. The, the gromov hausdorff distance is a little low of r, which is stronger than what you were suggesting, right? 
so the statement is that the, so the theorem, which is Benjamin and Tesser and then myself and Alex, um, is that the set of all gammas in gamma, so for almost every x, um, the points that are distance, you know, at most r from the identity, this is little o of r of the same thing in g infinity. Um, but the homogeneity of this carnot carey theodori metric, th this is, you can actually dilate just like you could in that picture. So this is really just uh, a fixed, a dilate of a fixed set, so of the ball of radius one. So this ball of radius one is the asymptotic shape of these random metrics. And, and, and that's in this case of a random population? Okay. Yeah, yeah, let's just say it there. I mean, the Gromov Hausdorff convergence is very related to that statement. Um, but this statement is, so I was actually thinking about this recently, but I, I really think that this statement is even more general than first passage percolation. I think you can come up with random metrics that you can't realize on a graph, so. Um, Okay, but this was uh, coincidental. We weren't ever aiming at this. <laughs> so we were actually wanting to do sub-additive ergodic theory. And it turned out to have this really nice interpretation. So I don't know who all does ergodic theory here. Um, but let me define a sub-additive co-cycle. Uh, so if I have a group acting so I'm transitioning away from this discussion of random metrics, so you can wake up or fall asleep or whichever. Uh, if I have a ergodic probability measure preserving action, and then uh, a map from the product into the positive reals is a subadditive co-cycle, I'll just abbreviate it, sub co-cycle. So I'll write the usual cycle equation and then put an inequality. Okay, so that's a definition, and it turns out that subadditive cocycles are the same thing as these equivariant random metrics. So we really just studied uh, these subadditive co-cycles and then in a page translated into this whole discussion. So let me tell you uh, the first subadditive ergodic theorem and then sort of show you how we were motivated. Um, so the first subadditive ergodic theorem is due to Kingman some time ago, maybe 60s. 40s. And so this is the case of the integer because you know dynamics is classically just over the integers. So what he says is that if you have such a subadditive cocycle, I'll go ahead and tell you the integrability condition since it came up. So there needs to be some integrability, and uh, for this it's just L1. So what you're interested in is, is studying the asymptotics of this co-cycle. So if you plug in, um, okay, so then for almost every x, this will be a pointwise statement. If you want to see how large or small this co-cycle is, if you normalize by the size of that integer, then this converges. And I can tell you what it converges to, but that's not the interesting part. Okay, and if you haven't thought about ergodic theory before, you might still think that this is just, I don't know, why is he talking about this? Um, so one, is, one thing is that this just immediately generalizes Birkhoff's pointwise ergodic theorem, which 
is if you've ever heard of ergodic theorem, it, it, it's the ergodic theorem. It's this time average tends to the space average theorem. And you sort of think of Birkhoff as being an additive process, and now this generalizes to subadditive processes, um, immediate generalization. You can also use it to prove a law of large numbers for matrix products. Pretty much any time there's a norm, you have a subadditive process. So you can also use this to prove oscillated theorem, which you might have heard of. Uh, so it has over 500 Google Scholar citations. So in ergodic theory, uh, this is a useful, <laughs> a useful theorem. So our idea, so you may also know uh, that Lindenstrauss proved a pointwise ergodic theorem for amenable groups. So that's like doing Birkhoff for amenable groups. And so our big question was for which group? amenable. And so the original idea of this project was to try to prove for all amenable groups a subadditive ergodic theorem. And when we started messing around, we found that the case of ZD had already been done by Bjorklund in 2010. And as you can guess, we only found the answer for no potent groups. <laughs> and uh, so I'll tell you the answer to this, uh, but I still really wonder what about amenable groups. So if you have an idea, let me know. Um, I want to get, I want to switch gears, so. Just state the subadditive ergodic theorem for, for no potent groups quickly, so I have a null potent group, and I have a ergodic probability measure preserving action, and a subadditive co-cycle, and I want to understand the asymptotics. Um, well, so I need the same conditions that I just erased for the statement of the theorem, because it's the, really the same theorem. So, well, the equivariance is built in, so now I just need, uh, for sake of time, I'll just say the associated random metric should be inner, almost surely. And then also this, uh, I can write the, the uniform by Lipschitz condition this way for some norm on gamma, and then the conclusion is that there's a, there's a norm, and it's a carnot carry theodore norm on the associated Carnot group, so that if you look at, okay, I want to look at some sequence of gamma n's and divide by their size, but I don't, well, the best way to, to talk about their size is to take a sequence converging to a point in the asymptotic cone. Um, So if I have a sequence of gamma n's that are converging to some point in the asymptotic cone, then the size of the gamma n's are proportional to n. They're just scaled by the size of g. So for almost every x, if you have such a sequence, then that implies that the renormalized co-cycles are converging to something, and it's the norm of g. So the norm is called G. So there's a unique norm so that whenever you look at their renormalized uh, co-cycle values, point-wise they're converging to something. So I'm a little confused. I mean, can, can you give some example, maybe explain a little bit more the connection between these co-cycles and this kind of method? I mean, there's. What are the main example of C that you should be thinking about? I, actually, the ones that I already gave you. So, I mean, the the translation is really boring. It's something like. Um, but you know, from this random assignment of one hundred pulse. You know. Yeah. So there's a translation between the co-cycle and the metric. It's like uh, the distance in X between the identity and I want to define this to be the co-cycle. So if you want an example, just take the example we had before and now think of the distance from the origin being the value of the co-cycle. So this is the translation between the two. 
I mean, we wanted this theorem, but all of the examples actually come from the random metrics. But, I mean, I think it says something about ergodic theory that, you know, okay, there isn't a motivating question, you know, motivating co-cycle uh, for the nullpotent groups, but this ergodic theorem still has some implications. If you're thinking about uh, an action on a manifold in the derivative co-cycle, this is not an example. This won't help. So I left off at that first Pansu theorem and then went into this, which was all supposed to be one big randomization of, of that Pansu theorem. Um, and, and that first Pansu theorem was some sort of rigidity statement because if you have quasi-isometric groups, then any asymptotic cone that you take along any non-principal ultra filter, uh, those things are by Lipschitz. Okay, and and Pensu said that those asymptotic cones are these nice these nice groups. Um, so I want to continue in the rigidity vein to another uh, two of Pensu's theorems and some generalizations. So that was meant to be one generalization. Um, so Pansu used that first theorem that I wrote to prove a really big theorem that I think maybe you were mentioning um, about this Maltsev question, right? So he proved that uh, if you have quasi-isometric nilpotent groups uh, finitely generated, then their associated Carnot groups that we've been speaking about are the same. They're isomorphic. So the associated Carnot groups, which I've been calling G-infinity, but now there's two of them, right? Uh, they're isomorphic as groups. So this was the state of the art on this Maltsev question for 15 years. Um, if it were true that they were more closely, well, in as much as the Carnot, uh, associated Carnot and the Maltsev are related, this is an answer to the Maltsev question, right? But in general, they're actually different. So you sort of think of it as being gamma, and then the Maltsev, and then the associated Carnot. And so he succeeded in saying that, well, the Carnot remembers everything, uh, but we still don't know that the Maltsev remembers everything. So this, was, this is a huge theorem, um, and he uses this to prove Mostow rigidity for quaternionic and Cayley hyperbolic space. And how does he prove this? So the third theorem of Pansu I'm going to write is he proves a Rademacher type differentiation theorem for Carnot spaces. So he proves that every by Lipschitz map between Carnot spaces is almost everywhere dif differentiable. And it's pretty immediate. Uh, okay, I don't fully understand the paper, but I think it's pretty immediate that that derivative uh, gives you an isomorphism of groups. So every by Lipschitz map between Carnot spaces, not thinking of the group structure yet, is differentiable, and I don't, haven't told you what the derivative means yet. And that derivative gives you a group isomorphism. So by Lipschitz map of Carnot spaces, they're actually the same group. Well, okay, so this theorem combined with his first theorem gives you his second theorem, because quasi-isometric groups have by Lipschitz cones. He tells you those cones are Carnot, and then his derivative tells you that those Carnot spaces are group isomorphic. So that's how you get this theorem. And the derivative, I mean, he has to invent a derivative for Carnot spaces. Uh, and it's differentiable at a point if, well, you should dilate on each group. So dilate by n, OK, t on one side, and then by t inverse on the other side. And this composition should converge on compact sets. of your favorite point. So 
So what I want to finish with is uh, an analog of the third theorem in a sort of random setting that also implies the second theorem. But first I have to tell you what measure equivalence is. So this is a equivalence relation on, let's say, just countable groups. And it's a measure theoretic parallel of quasi-isometry. So if you already like quasi-isometry, you might want to pay attention to this. I think it's really cool that there's this dual perspective. Um, OK, it was also introduced, this was introduced by Gromov. And let's say that two, let's just think of countable groups, that they're measure equivalent if there's an infinite measure space so that there's a commuting action of gamma and lambda on it. OK, so it should be measurable action, and it should be measure preserving. And then I need finite measure fundamental domains for each of the actions. So I'll take y and x inside of omega that are fundamental domains. So I can write omega as the gamma translates of y disjointly up to measure 0, and similarly over the lambdas. So if you thought about quasi-isometry before, I know a lot of people do and haven't heard this, that if you replace all of the measurable words with continuous words, you have an equivalent definition of quasi-isometry. So you replace this with continuous, proper, uh, Hausdorff space, or topological space, and it's actually equivalent to being quasi-isometric. Um, yes? It's in It's the space of maps between the two, and you have them act on the right and the left, pre and post composition. So there's a huge theorem, uh, and this has a lot to do with, I mean, OK, so I like this field a lot. And it has uh, a lot to do with orbit equivalence. So you might have heard uh, this result in the context of orbit equivalence, fundamental result. And it says that you shouldn't be looking at amenable groups from this pr perspective. So all amenable groups, uh, well, countable, OK are measure equivalent. So nothing to look at until recently. So Bader, Furman, and Sauer were also thinking about rigidity of lattices. And what they did is they took these fundamental domains. So I'm defining integrable measure equivalents now. So here's a fundamental domain for the lambda action. So I'm going to pick some point and then act by gamma. Now, there's a unique element of lambda that puts that point back in the fundamental domain. So this defines a cocycle, a measurable cocycle from gamma cross x into lambda. These are measurable cocycles. So what you can do is you can. Fix a gamma, and as x varies, you get an element of lambda. You could take a word norm. Now let's map into the reals, and you could ask that this was, say, L1. And so if there is such an action where these cocycles, both cocycles are L1, then you say that they're integrably measure equivalent, which I'm calling IME. So it's, OK, there's this well-studied measure equivalence, which is a parallel of quasi-isometry. There's nothing to look at for minimal groups. But if you put this extra integrability condition on it, uh, maybe there is. Maybe this really can distinguish groups, amenable groups. So recently, like last year, um, we found out that it actually does. So Lewis Bowen. Uh, 
showed that IME remembers growth. Right, the growth type of a finitely generated group. Uh, so, I mean, amenable groups have all kinds of growth. So this new equivalence relation really is you know, finer. And Tim Austin used... You mean, let's say, two things, a normal growth of different degrees, and then... They remember the degree, even. Yeah. And Tim used this to prove that uh, IME uh, no potent groups um, have by Lipschitz cones. Okay, so what do you get as a corollary? Well, you have some IME groups, they have by Lipschitz cones from Pansu's first theorem, you know that those are Carnot spaces. You apply his differentiation theorem, now you know that they're isomorphic groups. So IME, uh, no potent groups, have the same associated Carnot group. And in the paper, he asked for a direct proof of this because you apply this big hammer of Pansu. So let me sketch, I mean, <laughs> extremely briefly, just the idea of this theorem. So these co-cycles, if you fix a base point x, you get a map from gamma to lambda, right? And now you're supposed to think that g infinity is the asymptotic cone of gamma, and similarly here. So there's a sequence of maps which put gamma inside of g infinity denser and denser in like a more and more by Lipschitz way. So, and I'll call those, these are related to the dilations. And so if you pick an X and an N, then you get a map, which he calls kappa, between the asymptotic cones. And what Tim shows is that with high probability, there's a subsequence of the kappa XN that converge to a by Lipschitz map. And so, okay, and then you apply his differentiation theorem, Pansu's. So it would be nice if you just took this, this picture, this IME, and then knew that there was a group isomorphism up here to which these things were limiting. So I proved that. Um, there is a group isomorphism. Uh, to which these kappas converge not along a subsequence, but along the whole sequence. So still only with high probability, and this has to do with the weak integrability assumption, it's the best you can hope for. But I want to point out that um, I'm not relying on Pansu's differentiation theorem, uh, at least logically. So one last bridge is an observation of Shalom, which says that for amenable groups, Uh, Quasi-isometry actually implies L infinity measure equivalence, which just obviously implies integrable measure equivalence. So if you have a rigidity statement for IME, it implies a rigidity statement for quasi-isometry. So if I'm able to prove Pansu's second theorem uh, for IME groups, then I get it for free for quasi-isometric groups, for no potent groups, right? Um, okay, I'm not exactly not using his differentiation theorem. I mean, logically I don't, but it's some sort of analog, so it's not a generalization, it's only an analog, and here's why. So I told you that the derivative, the Pansu derivative, was kind of this picture. So let's restrict to the case, the deterministic case, where there's really just one map, right? There's just one point. Then what I'm saying is that when I compose like this, uh, with a single map in this case, uh, that this converges, right, on compacta. So 
this is actually the same thing as the fancy derivative in the case of a single point. Um, so this is like a measurable fancy derivative of a co-cycle. Um, so let me just say that Pansu uses analysis, and he uses a Lipschitz estimate, and I use ergodic theory and integrability estimate. And that I'm hopeful that maybe this IME ergodic theory side, I mean, for me, it's an easier proof <laughs> because ergodic theory is easier for me. Um, but somehow, like, doing random things is sometimes easier than doing something for a particular point. So I'm hoping to make some progress uh, on the Maltsev question from this perspective. That's a great question. I would have said that if the bell hadn't gone off. I wonder if these aren't the same equivalence relation uh, for nilpotent groups and then also for amenable groups. And if they're not, then there should be a, you can ask for an LP and LQ measure equivalence. And so if there are, if these are not the same equivalence relation, then there should be some LP and some LQ that distinguish pair of groups for one of them, but not the other. That would be interesting, I think. All right, thank you once again.